A man with no arms or legs sets out on a mission to climb the highest mountain in Africa. She was like, you're crazy. Like, how do you think you're gonna go and do Kilimanjaro? And I told her, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. See how he did just that. Plus, find out how to reduce your risk of stroke. All on today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the show. What started out as a regular day became a day 12-year-old Christy Fleury would never forget. As she was reunited with her dad, U.S. Army Reserve's Captain Joshua Fleury. April, Christy's mom contacted the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago to plan the homecoming surprise. The zoo had cameras rolling and shared the heartwarming moment on Twitter and Facebook. Take a look. God bless the Fleury family and all military families in this country. Thank you so much for your service. And of course, it's hard to watch those videos without getting teary-eyed as these children run to embrace mom or dad as those surprise visits occur. And I was reflecting upon watching that video how precious it is to always see these children just run up to mom or dad when they come back. And to think that we have a God, as described in Luke 15, that Jesus Christ runs to us that he runs to us when we're in need and he is always there advancing toward us with open arms. Well, a Utah mayor spent a night on the streets and a night in a homeless shelter as he was deciding on the new location of a new homeless center. Salt Lake City Mayor Ben McAdams recently shared that he went undercover with another county employee over a weekend in March. He describes not feeling safe and witnessing violence, drug use and heartbreaking scenes with families. Mayor McAdams says it was exhausting trying to find food and a bed and shared that it was a fact-finding mission, not a publicity stunt, saying the following, seeing what I saw was shocking, and I came away from this experience knowing we had to go forward. We had to change the system. Doing nothing is not an option, even if it's the end of me politically. I ran for office to make a difference, not to have a job. It's about doing the right thing for people who are in crisis. If I have to pay a personal price for moving this work forward, it's a price I'm willing to pay. And he certainly did go undercover, and it took many, many months for people to find out, and he's making a real difference in his community. Bravo. The mayor sent donations to cover his use of city resources. One well, other news, the Museum of the Bible is opening on November 17th, just three blocks from the U.S. Capitol, and it recently announced that it will not charge a fee for general admission. They will, however, suggest a $15 donation with guests under no obligation to pay anything. The museum will also offer guests the ability to reserve timed entry tickets. President of the Bible Museum, Carrie Summers, says our mission is to invite all people to engage with the Bible. The 430,000 square foot museum will have eight floors of artifacts, a restaurant, garden, performing arts theater, and a grand ballroom. It's been recognized as a must-see museum and one of the most anticipated and beautifully designed museums opening in 2017. And it certainly sounds like it is definitely worth a trip. Well, up next, information that could save your life. Every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke. There's almost 2 million brain cells dying every minute while that blood flow is cut off. There is some good news. 80% of strokes are preventable. Find out how right after this. Sudden numbness or weakness, confusion, trouble seeing, and severe headache. If you experience any of these symptoms, you need to act fast. Quick action can mean the difference between life and death. Take a look.
In the next 40 seconds, someone in the United States will be attacked by our nation's fifth leading cause of death. In the time it takes to watch this segment, someone will lose their life to a stroke. Here's what you need to know to protect yourself from this devastating killer. When our patients come in, they're critically ill. A major portion of their brain is not functioning properly. It's here in Hampton Roads, Virginia, at DePaul's Comprehensive Stroke Center, that Dr. John Baker and his team work to rescue patients suffering from the damaging effects of a major stroke. Using state-of-the-art medical technology, they can quickly pinpoint the areas of the brain that have been affected and take action. It's a situation where every second counts. When a blood clot goes up into the brain inside the artery and cutting off blood flow, there's not enough oxygen and nutrients to the brain. Some people estimate that there's almost 2 million brain cells dying every minute while that blood flow is cut off. Therefore, it's very important to get that blood flow restored as fast as possible. Just like a heart attack, a stroke can strike anyone at any time. And just as in a heart attack, the lack of blood flow damages the brain. There are two basic types of stroke. Uh, the first one is where a blood clot ends up inside an artery and plugs it up and causes low blood flow to the brain. The second is a little less common, uh, is where the brain has an artery or vein that bleeds and causes uh, pressure on the brain. Knowing the warning signs of a stroke and acting quickly are the keys to protecting yourself or those you love. If a stroke is suspected, remember, be fast. The first is balance. The person may be unsteady in their walking. The second one is E, their eyes. They may have visual difficulties. F is face, that they may have a weakness on one side of the face or to the other. The next one is an arm weakness, a droop down. And then the next one is slurring of their speech, the, the S. And then T is for time, that we need to really move fast. Call 911 immediately if you or someone you know is experiencing any of these symptoms. An ambulance will rush the patient to the nearest stroke center. When the patient arrives, scans will be performed to determine if a stroke has happened and what treatment is needed. That allows us to start getting the intravenous medicines, uh, the TPA, to try to break up that clot going even faster. And then we start looking for which artery and vein caused the problem. Uh, and then we can immediately go up inside the artery and try to remove clots that are blocking it, or we can go up inside the artery or vein and try to seal it off if it was causing bleeding into the brain. What if you could press the rewind button before a stroke has happened? According to the National Stroke Association, up to 80% of all strokes are preventable. Protecting yourself starts with getting the facts. The risk factors for stroke increase with advancing age. That's usually due to things like long-standing high blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes with high blood sugars, high cholesterol, things that are untreated, long-term smoking. So the longer that goes, the more injury there are to the blood vessels. Getting your blood pressure under control is your first line of defense. What's one of the best ways to do this? Lose weight. According to the American Heart Association, losing as little as 10 pounds can help lower your blood pressure, nearly as much as the equivalent of one blood pressure medication. Not only will losing weight help lower your blood pressure, it will also lower your risk of type 2 diabetes. People who are diabetic are at greater risk for stroke, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. Here's one simple way to lose weight. Drink water. A study in the UK found that adults who drank 16 ounces of water 30 minutes before meals were able to drop nine pounds over 12 weeks. Go for a walk. Walking every day can help you lose weight and lower your blood pressure. Walking with a friend can help you build an enjoyable habit. And partner with your doctor. Be sure to ask questions during your next office visit. Remember, you are the biggest advocate for your health. If you have any heart-related issues, talk about it. Untreated heart conditions set the stage for stroke. One of the other risk factors for an ischemic stroke is an irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation. With that irregular heartbeat, little clots can form in the heart and leave the heart and go up and lodge in the brain, cutting off blood flow. 
Don't disregard important warning signs. If you notice a sudden headache or become lightheaded, if your vision is blurred or you have trouble speaking, even if it goes away, don't ignore it. You might be experiencing a mini stroke or a TIA. The signs and symptoms of a transient ischemic attack or TIA are exactly the same as a stroke at the onset. It's just that they get better very quickly. So we treat them identically. In fact, a TIA is a wonderful thing for us to be able to treat because it's a stroke that could be prevented in the future as opposed to somebody that's already having a big stroke. The most important thing about stroke is to try to prevent one before it happens. Preventing that brain injury is so much better than trying to treat the stroke once it occurs. Preventing a stroke is possible. Find out your risk factors and start making necessary changes. The Bible says that a heart at peace gives life to the body. God loves you and cares about every detail of your life. Ask Him to help you as you practice new healthy habits. He delights to do good things for His children. God bless you. Well, that story certainly hits close to home for me. My father had a stroke. It was devastating to his health, devastated our family, and he never came back from it. So this is very important information. If you want to find out more ways to protect your brain, watch 700 Club Interactive throughout this week. Experts will tell you how you can discover the secret to a younger brain and how to change dangerous habits that threaten your health. You'll learn how to live smarter and stay mentally sharp. Or you can order our DVD. It has all five parts of the series and it's completely free. Just log on to CBN.com or call us at 800-700-7000. Just tell the person who answers the phone you want that DVD, protect your brain. Well, still ahead, a man born without arms and legs defeats the odds. We're so quick to go and dismiss the fact that we're able to go and do these amazing things. I'm gonna climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Gonna see how he does the impossible when we come back. Stay with us. We have an amazing story to share with you now. Kyle Maynard is a man who lives by the motto, no excuses. He was born with no arms and no legs, but has never been one to back down from a challenge. And that attitude propelled him all the way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Take a look. Kyle Maynard is tough, real tough. He's a champion wrestler. He studied Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He can bench 420 pounds and every day, he conquers the impossible. Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Kyle began leaving a new trail the moment he entered the world. He was born without arms or legs, the result of a rare condition known as congenital amputation. Yeah, my, my parents, they had just normal normal pregnancy. They went and saw the ultrasounds and the doctor saw that there was really nothing out of the ordinary. So they really had no idea that anything was going to happen, you know, uh, that it'd be born different until I was. Normally, congenital amputation only affects a finger or a toe. In this case, Kyle was left with no limbs and his parents were left with questions on how to raise their child. What really blows me away is the decisions that my mom and dad made. They had to make when they were super young. You know, my mom, she was more of like the nurturing type and wanting to help me with stuff and help me figure out how to go and do things and, and didn't want to see me struggle. My dad realized that by helping me do everything wasn't going to be the best solution to the problem. I'd say like, you know, learning how to eat, you know, he's got to figure out how to eat on his own or, or starve. As you can imagine, it wasn't easy, but Kyle learned the basics and soon, he wasn't just able to do the things others could do, he was doing them better. My mom tells a story about when I like, got in the closet and ripped all the clothes off the rack, and she was like partially a little ticked off at me, but partially like, wow, this is cool, like, you, you know, he did that. By the time he reached middle school, Kyle wanted to take it up a notch. One day he told his mom he wanted to go out for the football team. His mom called the coach, and the coach said, sure. So I was a nose guard playing in the middle. I thought I was going to be the quarterback, but that was a whole other story. I remember the very first football game that I played in, and one of the first plays that they ran was coming right up, right up the middle. 
you know, and I remember that moment in my, the way I'd tackle people is taking my helmet and smashing it into their legs as hard as I could. In that moment, it was like I, I had found an 11 year old, you know, version of purpose in life. At the time, Kyle was just a sixth grade kid who had to work twice as hard to get half as far. His parents, who were Christians, had assured him that there was a grand plan for his life. Now, Kyle understood. His goal, see the impossible, beat the impossible. And I definitely, you know, was at a pretty big depth of despair at 10 years old and, you know, and really had a lot of fear over what the future was gonna be. And I was definitely at a point where I'd lost a lot of hope, you know, just didn't see reason even to go on. And I really think that making my first tackle in football might have been what, you know, nearly saved my life. That moment fueled a competitive nature inside Kyle. So after football, he took up wrestling. And soon he was winning matches. And it wasn't long before the no-legged men winning the butt-kicking contests became a media sensation. He wrote a book called No Excuses. He also became a popular motivational speaker and made dozens of TV appearances. He is one of the most inspiring young men will ever hear about. He's strong too, I might add. <laughs> Kyle Maynard is tough. He has to be. He has no arms or legs, but he makes up for that with an indomitable spirit, one buoyed by a faith in Christ. Part of, of Christ's message was teaching us so we could go and do way more than we think that we can. You know, he'd telling a mountain to move from here to here and it'll do it, right? And we can go and think of that like figuratively, like, oh, okay, yeah, it's just a saying, whatever. But like, no, I mean, like, what if that's the literal, what if that's the literal truth and we're just sort of like, well, okay, it's just a saying. We're so quick to go and dismiss the fact that we're able to go and do these amazing things too. And I think that being connected to something bigger than ourselves is the only way to, to reach that place. Now, normally, this is where a story ends. You have your hero, faces the great obstacle, overcomes it, and lives happily ever after. But in Kyle's case, this is where his story really begins. My message is a pretty simple one. After high school, Kyle went on the speaking circuit. But before long, Kyle considered doing something he'd never really done before, quit. I put on like 25, 30 pounds in like a three or four month book tour. It was just this period of time where I was just like, blah. People would say to me after a speech that my story was inspiring and all that. I know that their intent was that it would make me feel good but a lot of times it didn't. You know, a lot of times it just made me feel different. During this time, Kyle came up with a nickname for himself, the depressed motivational speaker. I was alone. You know, I would be traveling, I'd be up in a hotel room by myself. You know, I, did, I was 19 years old, 20 years old, I'm speaking on stage with senators and presidents and like, you know, for Fortune 500 companies. And it's like, who am I to go and tell you guys how to run your business? Like. It was crazy, and I think a big part of it was I did not feel like authentic with the message that I was sharing. I didn't feel like, like I was actually living the message that I was talking about. And then, a turning point. A chance meeting at an airport with two soldiers who said they saw Kyle on TV and were inspired by his life. You know, I think that made a huge difference in, in learning to accept that, embrace it, and wanting to be anything that I do, put my feet into, be the best in the world that I can be. You know, I'm competitive. and. I think that, that was a big game changer for me. In 2011, Kyle met a Gold Star mother. Her son, Corey Johnson, had been killed in Afghanistan earlier that year. She told Kyle that her son had always wanted to travel and see Mount Kilimanjaro. And soon, Kyle had a new challenge. I told my friend that night, I'm gonna climb Mount Kilimanjaro. She was like, you're crazy. Like, how do you think you're gonna go and do Kilimanjaro, and I told her, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. Kilimanjaro has been called the House of God. It's so high that climbers will pass through five ecological zones before getting to the summit. Temperatures range from 80 degrees at the base to minus 15 degrees at the top. It's a taxing climb for anyone, but Kyle wouldn't back down. I've got some really amazing people in my life that I've been so fortunate to have that when I say something crazy like that, instead of them telling me, oh, you're crazy, you're not gonna go and do it, most of them are like, wow, that's cool, how can I help? 
I've got friends that made my gear out of duct tape and duct tape bath towels on the ends of my arms and my feet. I couldn't just go to like the hiking store and like get like a pair of hiking shoes. Like I had to have, we had to come up with a whole new system. Now there are risks to the climb. The higher you go, the less oxygen there is to breathe. You're doing great. The colder it gets, the greater the risk for frostbite. Not to mention the dust or the dry rocks. Kyle was going to deal with this for 30 miles, crawling every inch of the way. Most times, I'm literally, my face is in the dirt, six inches off the ground. Nobody really told me that I shouldn't bear crawl on my elbows and knees for 30 miles before I went. My shoulders and back and hip were shot. My arms, like the swelling in my arms was really intense. So it's this total dichotomy going on of some moments of just intense suffering, like, why am I here? Why did I do this? To other moments of like, wow, this is really cool. This is really beautiful. And, connecting to that reason to just why I was there in the first place. After a grueling journey, Kyle was near the top. But the important thing wasn't just how close he was to the summit. It was how far he'd already come. I'm sitting on ice and I'm looking back and I could see the entire trail that we'd come up. And it was the wildest thing to go and see. The trail just went on and on and on forever, like out of sight. And I was like, holy cow, like wow, like we actually went that far. Like, it's amazing. Hemingway once wrote, all he could see, as wide as the world, was a square top of Kilimanjaro. And then, he knew that there was where he was going. Kyle Maynard was there, 19,000 feet in the air, as the first quadruple amputee to summit the mountain. And once again, he beat the impossible. Uh, <laughs> I held it together at the top uh, until I called my mom and she started crying and I just broke. And I started crying after that too. And a couple moments after that, I got to pay tribute to a fallen soldier. You know, in those really tough moments where I was feeling sorry for myself and ready to quit, a lot of it was thinking, man, he's never gonna get this chance to be here and go and climb this mountain. And it, it really kept me going. It just absolutely was, it was the greatest honor of my life. Kyle returned home and earned an ESPY award for his efforts. He also came back with a different perspective. And now, he's not just working to conquer the impossible, he's helping others do the same. And I've learned whatever gifts that we've been giving, like you gotta go and share it. And sometimes that means doing things that are uncomfortable that every fiber in your body doesn't want you to do. Then you gotta do it anyway. When I was younger, I did pray a lot that like I would just wake up and have arms and legs. Now I think those prayers have been answered in a, in a totally different way, in a way that I couldn't have ever imagined before. It's come in the form of the learning that I've gotten to have, and that can transcend into anything. Now there's nothing in the world that you could offer me to have me live my life again differently. I feel like it's the biggest blessing I've ever received being born the way that I was. Wow, Kyle Maynard, if, if we are not inspired by that story and by his life, we need to check our pulse because obviously he is simply an unbelievable man. And you know, some, it makes me reflect on the fact that sometimes the doldrums I get in, melancholy or feeling sorry for myself or a circumstance I'm in or how I'm being treated, Kyle Maynard doesn't have time for that. And you know, if we're Christ followers, if I could just talk to Christians right now, if we're living a defeated life, We've really got to check our perspective on where we are in our relationship with Jesus. We're not called to live that way. We're not call, called to live sorry for ourselves. Jesus promises us an abundant life full of joy, not necessarily happiness, that our circumstances will be happy, but joy that is found in relationship with Christ. And if you're living in a defeated fashion, if we're not excited about our faith and what our Savior has done for us, Look at Kyle Maynard and the example he is, that he truly can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. Even when he was speaking to companies, motivational speaking, he acknowledged he was transparent and truthful. I had my days of sorrow. It wasn't just always upbeat, yet he persevered and he still has troubles and challenges emotionally like all of us. But he said, Lord, I'm gonna serve you I'm gonna find my strength in you. And for us today, we need to recognize it is sinful. It is sinful for us to live discouraged 
and not be victorious, at least in our relationship with Christ and all He has done for us, if He does nothing more for us than the sacrifice on the cross so we could have eternal life, that really is enough. We leave you today with 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Thank you for joining me today. If you need prayer, you can always call us at 800-700-7000. Until tomorrow, I'm Andrew Knox. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.